like to welcome everyone here in the audience and on our live stream who joined us for this public talk with uh, Silvia Trebowski and Luisa Nader. And um, we're talking about Le Silvia's recent work, Who Will Save Us? It is a 14 minute long video that has been especially produced for our exhibition at King Charles Travels. And we opened it yesterday evening. This is very nice. <laughs> I'm Melanie Unemuth, director of King Charles Travels. And um, I have having had the pleasure to work with Sylvia Trebowski together on this exhibition. Alongside uh, with Who Will Save Us, we show a work uh, from Sylvia from 2019, um, which is entitled Missing Asher. Both films are linked in the info box below of this image for the audience uh, online. Um, so we are mostly planning to talk about um, who will save us, um, but Missing Asher is also linked to make the picture full, but you can watch it later, maybe after the talk. Um, so the plan for today's talk is to first to introduce the panelists, Sylvia Krabowski and uh, Luisa Nader, and then watch the new film, Who Will Save Us? We here in the exhibition space um, together, and you uh, on the computers can watch it uh, via the Vimeo link in the info box below. And then we come back together here at, I would say, in 4.20, yeah. And then we will start the conversation of Luisa Nada and Silvio Kolbowski that will mainly be about who will save us, its contents, the format, and the process of developing the film, as well as Silvia's general working process. Um, the talk itself is scheduled until approximately 5.30. If you want to ask questions, either during the talk or after the conversation, you can post them in the YouTube um, channel and we will try to include them. For that, you would need to be registered uh, at YouTube. And we are happy to get into conversation with you this way and with you live. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, one more additional information. I have also conducted an interview with Silvio um, during her process or process of realizing who will save us. The interview will be available as PDF or as a brochure in about a week or so in German and English language in, um, on our website. So now I would like to welcome the panelists for today, Silvia Krabowski and Luis Anada. I want to thank you both uh, so very much for making the trip to Glava <laughs> and being here in person and to celebrate the new exhibition that we have together. Silvia Krabowski, born in 1963 in Buenos Aires. Um, she lives and works since over 50 years in New York and has exhibited widely and has taught at international universities and art academies. Um, she was co-editor of the journal October from 1993 to 2000 and still serves today on, on the advisory board. She has taught in the independent studies program in the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York at CCC master's program at the Haute Ecole d'Art et Dessin in Geneva, in the architecture department at Parsons School of Design in New York, and um, at the School of Art in the Cooper Union in New York. Sylvia Kolbowski's writings have appeared in numerous catalogs and art journals, including Art Bomb, Texte zu Kunst, Documents, Parachute, and October. In 2013, she in initiated a blog as an extension of her artistic practice where she publishes cultural and political texts and analysis. Luisa Nada is an art historian, professor at the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw, author of the books 
conceptual art in Poland from 2009 and theory of seeing war drawings in memory of friends, Jews from 2018. Her research is focused primarily on the 20th century and contemporary art with a special focus on the art practices from the 60s and the 90s, uh, 70s. Methodologies of art history, methods of oral history, memory, discourse, theories of effect and trauma, relations between limit events, experiences, and the cultural field. Currently, she's working on the visual notations, artifacts, reports, and testimonies from and of the Holocaust on the subject positions of the witnesses and the observers. You both have met each other some years ago in the preparation of an exhibition of yours, Sylvia, at you, can you say it, please? <laughs> at the Contemporary Arts Center in Warsaw. It was in 2006. Yeah. And uh, Sylvia was um, exhibiting her tremendous work, An Inadequate History of Conceptual Art. And we both met a year before uh, when I was in Rochester and then in New York. And I would love to mention Douglas Krim, Krimp, uh, who was an author of our encounter. Mm. Okay. So now maybe we might have a first question, or like a first of me. Maybe there is it you think uh, useful to make a brief introduction to who will say first before we watch before it? Before people watch yeah. it. Yeah, <coughs> like maybe just briefly on how the first thought, how it came together as a mm. mashup of these two films, it's, and maybe why these two films, mm -hmm. and then we watch it and then... Okay. Yeah. So you want me to say yeah. something? Um, well, actually, when Melanie reached out to me, I'm caught between looking at the camera and, and looking at the audience, but when Melanie reached out to me, I, I think it was at about a year ago already, mm -hmm. I had been already doing some research into what um, was, in a sense, fascinating me and troubling me the most at that moment about contemporary culture in both the United States and other parts of the world, which had to do with the question of the role of the unconscious in group dynamics with regard to po politics. And I guess if you know anything about American politics of the past uh, six years or so, that wouldn't be surprising as, as a concern of mine. Um, so I was already doing research into this, and did not have a full idea of what form the project would take. Um, but when Melanie offered me the opportunity to exhibit something, I started to think about the form more. And <clears throat> I guess it's a long story, but basically um, I arrived at the idea of drawing on two films uh, from the past one, a very famous film by Fritz Lang called Metropolis, which strangely enough I had actually never seen before. And the other one is a not so famous, but a kind of cult science fiction film uh, made by George Lucas in 1971. Um, and I guess we can talk later about why I decided to intercombine these. Mm -hmm and by intercombining them to address this question of how groups, uh, not to say mobs, get formed in relation to politics in a given moment. Which is really the idea of, you know, how do, how do groups regress? How do they become dysfunctional with regard to politics? Okay. So that's probably that's a, enough. I think that's maybe enough. Uh, enough or an introduction. To maybe describe too much uh, the film. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I hope the link works uh, on, on Vimeo, but it should work now. And um, I guess we just now watch the film together. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe I can say that um, while, you're, while people are watching, I'll check my email. And if there is a problem, people should email me. Yeah. OK. <laughs> So the film is about 14 minutes. I'm 14 minutes. 14 yeah. minutes, and um, I think we meet again at 4:30. Okay. Yeah.
Mm. Luisa, you have um, prepared questions and the conversation uh, to, to do the conversation with Sylvia, and I want to uh, ask you if you could start now. Thank well, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for this um, wonderful exhibition. And um, I would like to start um, with some comments about your past, Sylvia. So uh, I think that in your artistic activity from the early 80s onwards, uh, there's a constellation of ideas, of theories, and of opus operandi. And I want to enlist only a few of them, such as uh, feminism-oriented practices, uh, institutional critique, site and site specificity, and on a more broad, I would say, level of humanistics and humanistic thought. It will be history, memory, uh, repetition, flashback, um, power relations, uh, capitalism, neoliberalism, and the relation between human psyche and the field of uh, politics. And um, I wonder if you could sketch for us your cultural genealogy, and if you uh, if you could pinpoint for us a few encounters, um, moments, political moments also, or perhaps accidents in your artistic um, career that were decisive for what you are doing at the moment? Hmm. Wow. Uh, I don't think I've ever been asked for the biographical comment before. Um, let's see, if I were to condense it, I would have to say that although I was, I had this idea that I would be an artist from about the time I was, I think about 12, um, I was not a very sophisticated uh, person growing up in the sense that I, I was not raised in a family that was sophisticated about culture. I was interested, very interested in art and I used to go to museums by myself in New York, but I was, I would say about, I was about 10 to 20 years behind uh, what was au courant. And so when I went away to college, I, I was a painter and I did sculpture as well. And I was very taken, it's almost embarrassing to say it, but I was very taken with, for example, abstract expressionism. And this was in around 1970, 71. So it was really uh, retarded air. Um, but I, so I went away to college at a certain point. I, I moved back to New York to finish college because I felt very disconnected from art. I mean, from, let's say, um, other practices and contemporary practices. I had always been fascinated by what used to be called at the Museum of Modern Art, the project room. At, which was a very small room that where they stuck all the video and all the kind of conceptual video, uh, conceptual art in video form. So that was always very interesting to me. But by the time I came back to New York, um, I think the one, there were, there were two things that really influenced me over the next couple of decades. One was that because I had been very involved in the anti-Vietnam War movement when I was very young, like 13, 14, 15, um, when I came back to New York, when I went back to New York, I decided to join, uh, to go to some meetings of, in New York, what was called Artists Meeting for Cultural Change. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that, you probably do know that mm -hmm. group. It, it was a group of, it was a large group of artists that had formed in opposition to the war in Vietnam and they had staged a lot of protests over the years, but by the time I went to the meetings, the war was over, of course. This was in 75, I think. And the group was disbanding. They really didn't know what to do with themselves. They were no longer held together by the anti-war movement. Uh, it, so 
they decided to, that they would split up into different reading groups and they gave people the option of, you know, join the reading group that you want. And there was one reading group that somebody had formed that was called Feminism and Psychoanalysis. Obviously that had a huge <coughs> impact and I joined that group. The group was filled with film theory, women uh, studying and writing on film theory and psychoanalysis and feminism. I was the only artist uh, and I was the only non-film person as a matter of fact, I think. And we read some amazing texts that had a big impact on me. The, the second thing I think, so I started to work more conceptually at that point. Um, the second thing that had a very big impact on me was um, the be beginning of starting to think really seriously about form. Mm -hmm. uh, because I had been thinking more about ideas and you know, how to express certain I ideas, but mostly by focusing on, on the, let's say, political matter or the discourse. Uh, but, but I was not happy about what I felt was a kind of arbitrariness of form. So at that point, I, I personally started to read about conceptual art. It was completely out of favor in New York at the time. And this was in the early, actually, at some point in the 80s, probably in the late 80s. Um, and I remember reading some kind of comment by the, Ash the artist Michael Asher and his very famous comment, which was, um, why put something on the floor? Why put something on the wall? And that really shook my thinking about art. And that's when I started to move into not what was called site, well, I, I developed something that I called uh, site transferability because I was very interested in site specificity, but I realized that the exhibition system had become globalized and there was no possibility of being site specific really anymore because the spaces were so generic. So it's a long story, but that's sort of the, the beginnings of my thinking much more seriously about form. Uh, so the piece on Michael Asher is not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, so in Kunsthaus Glarus here, we have these two films in one exhibitional space, yes? Uh, Missing Michael Asher from 2019, and Who Will Save Us, your very recent film piece. And I wonder, and it's perhaps a question to both of you, um, what was the idea behind uh, juxtaposing these two works uh, together, Missing Usher and Who Will Save Us? Um, I think there was not like a conscious decision about doing that, I must say. I just chose, because um, Who Will Save Us is like, when did you finish the film? Like 10 days ago or something. <laughs> so, I mean, sure, uh, we knew for some weeks uh, together in uh, different uh, st uh, closeness um, what was going on and what Sylvia was working on or kind of the um, probability of what kind of work that might become. But um, still, uh, at some point, I knew there was two spaces that are also very different spaces in a way. And um, I really loved Michael Asher, uh, Missing Michael Asher film, and so I just chose it. Mm. And it was like, I don't know, um, a conscious decision for the film that I want to have it in that mm -hmm. particular space. And you were I just mean, drawn to the project. Yeah, and uh, as far as I know, your work, I think it's clear that it's all intertwined. Mm. So it was not sure. I was thinking about if it's like really fitting or what is fitting in a way. I mean, we also have another exhibition here, Laura, Laura Lange's exhibition also opened yesterday. And so I think about the whole house. And um, so I think 
this also uh, was uh, going into my decision making um, to have all coming together, not too close, but vibing with each other. Mm -hmm. And you also liked it in the end that uh, yeah, I thought I friends. thought it was. Uh, I, I was a little bit surprised at the choice because I think that you know, to be. I mean, I, I, in a way, um, I, I have a kind of taxonomy of my work in my head, and I think of that. It's a terrible thing to say, but I think of it as a minor project, even though I love that project. I. And so I was actually very happy that you chose it mm -hmm. because I, I thought it was, um, you know, it was, it was a kind of statement. It was, it was kind of elevating what I think of as a somewhat minor project to, uh, to a different, uh, it, it, you know, to giving it a different context and a different kind of level of importance because that film was made um, in response to a very specific request, you know, from, from another curator. Um, so it's not a film that came out of, it's not a project that came out of my own mm -hmm. sort of e evolution in thinking about, you know. So, so I'm actually very happy because I've been able to think about it in a different way yeah. um, than I did before. I don't know if you had that reaction, but. And I mean, I love the choice because it's not obvious yeah, at it's all. Not, it's really not obvious. It's not it's obvious. obvious. And uh, maybe we should say it uh, more clearly for the public and for the audience right. here that uh, Missing Usher is very much about uh, art markets and, uh, um, you know, uh, art gallery system. But it's also very much about memory and knowledge and uh, building knowledge. And um, well, we should maybe say for people who haven't seen it yeah. that it's uh, it's it, my attempt to trace. I was asked to re-exhibit an artwork that was done in 1990, mm -hmm. and because the work had been sold, and I didn't know where it ended up, I I decided to do some detective work mm -hmm. to try to trace it. And in doing that detective work, um, it revealed um, a remarkable kind of story about um, the progression or the, the development of the status of market art uh, through a, a particular period of globalized capitalism. So it's about art, but it's very much a story about the effect of globalized capital, actually, on art. Yes, so I would say the link between the two films, two film pieces, are uh, neoliberalism. Sorry? Is, is neoliberalism? Yeah. yeah. OK. Well, both, both uh, projects uh, are a critique, an implied critique, of neoliberal capitalism or of globalized Capitalism. Mm -hmm. There's not, yeah. There's no question. Okay, so the uh, title of the exhibition here is very, you know, um, powerful. It's the witch's fault, and uh, this is a quotation from the film piece "Who Will Save Us." And um, in this, I have to say, it, breathless piece, you are using and misusing, as you said. THX and Metropolis. And uh, what is very uh, interesting to me is that I just found out that these uh, two films, although they are very distant in time, they have a lot of in common. For example, the fabula placed in a very distant uh, future. So they are both sci-fi films in a way. And this future, this future is frightening one, the dystopian one. Uh, the aesthetic of both films is very much related to the time of their inception. So it's expressionism in the case of Metropolis and it's a minimalist art and maybe even conceptual art in the case of THX 1138. Mm. Um, there is also a very similar political message, I would say, uh, which considers the power and manipulation performed on the 
controlled uh, society. And there is also an ethical message, um, bringing hope, yes, <laughs> through positive effects such as love. And I wonder what kind of, you know, ideas, um, events, uh, moments did trigger who will save us? And if you could, um, you know, uh, talk a little bit about your thinking process that led you to this film. Um, really what the, what the film does is try to represent two different regimes um, beginning with the earlier part of the 20th century and continuing through to today. So the two different governing regimes. So Metropolis, <clears throat> Metropolis for me represents a particular moment of capitalism and a particular type of subjectivity for the worker. Um, and, you know, which is connected to industrialization and mechanization, but in an analog way. The THX film represents for me the, the shift into the algorithmic regime and what that does to work, to bodies, to, um, uh, uh, and in both cases, what it does uh, at a cyclical uh, to, the, to, the, to the human psyche mm -hmm. as well, and to interrelationships and so on. Um, it, you know, it seemed to me, well, I, I, <laughs> like thinking out loud, I think that my motivation in using both of these together, because I could have gone just with the algorithmic regime, mm -hmm. since that is the most relevant to this particular moment, but I don't see them as separate. And, and I wanted the spectator to understand that we can't really think of these things, as, these regimes as separate, mm -hmm. you know, that one um, creates the possibility for the other one. Um, so I, it, it was really about thinking in terms of the title, you know, who will say, well, it's the witch's fault. Is that the title of the... No, it's Who Will Save Us, actually. Who Will Save Us is, I'm sorry, <laughs> the poster. It's supposed to. Um, that's right, because that's an illustration, yeah. it's not a title. Uh, so we decided that the, the title would be Who Will Save Us, and who will say... That, that phrase actually comes from uh, a psychoanalytic interpretation uh, of how groups function when they are regressive and not functioning properly, where the, the implicit uh, plea of the group, of a group that is not functioning well and not making, not working well, uh, and for example, such a group can exist um, as, a, as a voting, a massive, you know, tens of millions of voters. It can exist uh, within the category of, for example, the military, the church, you know, groups are many things. It, in the psychoanalytic sense that Wilfred uh, Bion or Bion um, articulate, I mean, wrote about. So um, the implicit plea of the dysfunctional group is who will save us. Mm -hmm. And this necessity of looking for an external savior, mm -hmm. I think, is something that arises out of um, precarity um, and out of the, the kind of disintegration and the um, uh, dysfunction that I see globalized capital is producing for populations. Um, so, I mean, that's how this project came about, just out of my concerns for... I, I think that while when you read an article, uh, you know, a, a text that analyzes groups from a psychoanalytic perspective, whether it's from Bion or Freud, you know, or other theorists, 
I don't think it's, it, to me, it really clarifies what people have so much trouble understanding in dysfunctional groups. You know, like in a popular sense, I don't think that there's any real understanding of how Trump's base functions mm -hmm. or how the base that hates Trump's base functions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as an artist, I see the possibility of presenting um, a possibility for understanding something like that, which is not discussed in the <clears throat> popular realm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but I, I would say that um, uh, one can uh, read a very inception of your interest in uh, the relation between, you know, let's say, disturbed political leader and the group in your much earlier project, That Monster, an allegory, which is, let's say, uh, focused very much on a figure, on an individual, deeply disturbed, uh, on a psychic uh, level, but also driven by anger, shame, and revenge, which is rooted in a historical inequality and injustice. And when I watch uh, Who Will Save Us, I just think that you are on the other side of the story. Yes, so you, who will save us? So it's about the group, yeah. the social, the social uh, group in crisis. Uh, well, I think, it, I think uh, it's important, we were talking about it this before, Louisa, that I think that there is a kind of um, smug, um, sense on the part of those who don't consider themselves to be part of a mob. I think that there's a, a smug kind of um, assumption that they know how this other group is dysfunctional. And when you mentioned the, you know, the pronoun us, yeah. of course, it's, it's hard to know who that is. But what I'm, what I'm trying to do with both the last work and this one is really to, um, to challenge, typically the group that comes to a museum is not, in my experience, not going to be radically right wing. Mm -hmm. And so often they find, I think they assume a very safe position of, um, being outside of dysfunction. But I see both groups as participating in a similar dysfunction. And, and that's partly the challenge, I hope, that the work you know, uh, um, establishes for, for the audience. Yes, I would say that it's very hard to be distanced yes, from the anxiety, aggression, regression, that is act, you know, being acted out in the, uh, in the film. But I want, you about, uh, I, I want to ask you not about theory, but more about the form. And as you said, uh, political theories or uh, the idea of subjectivity is very much intertwined with form in, uh, in your works. So uh, I wonder if you could share with us your thoughts and your process of working with the medium on form, uh, with cuts and montage. Uh, what was your uh, idea about narration and structure on the, on the film? And if you could say something about the kind of rhetorics that is um, mm. intertwined uh, in the film. You know, first of all, I want to say that I have a very modest view of my work. I do not imagine that my work is going to change either many minds and certainly not change anything very significant about the world. Sometimes, in a discussion like this, I feel that there's more potential. You know, like, like the work is situated in this discussion that we're having. And there, I feel a little less modest about its potential. The work itself, we can talk 
about all the effects that I think it might, you know, that I intended, and that you certainly read into the work, that you read into the work. But I have no idea <laughs> if it's having, um, I think that I am happy if I can feel that the work creates a resonance, right? And in that sense, that is, comes from the form mm -hmm. as well. So for me, it, ideally, what the form in this particular film, uh, the potential that it has is to, um, to bring these two very disparate things together to create a kind of charge you know, a, a charge for the spectator. And, and I don't think, I don't imagine that the spectator walks away with a kind of treatise in, you know, treatise in their head about uh, what they've experienced. Mm -hmm. But that it at least creates this charge where I, I would be very happy if the spectator walked away thinking, oh, well, here's the algorithm, and now I have to think the algorithm in relation to industrialization you know, in relation to the machine. And, and I'm looking at these bodies that, you know, one under the, the rule of the algorithm, one under the rule of the regime. I, I would be very happy if the, and that comes from the cuts. Mm -hmm. And it, it comes from the kind of, um, uh, the collision of the, you know, the cuts create a kind of, you know, coming together repeatedly. Um, but is there, like, I'm also interested in this question, I find it very interesting. Is there, could you maybe describe in, a, in one section of the film how you maybe brought something together? Yeah. Because it's like, uh, how long is Metropolis? Four hours? And I guess uh, THX is also one and a half or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a certain the aggression in your yeah. actions. So I would like to stress it that um, uh, you act on both films quite aggressively. So you destroy them, I would say, formally, mm -hmm. but also on the level of political meanings. So I, I, I wonder, you know, what is this aggression about and what you couldn't stand in both mm. films and political statements? Um. Well, first, formally, I would say, I mean, for those who have seen it who are watching, the, the, um, I, I realized at a certain point that what I wanted from the Metropolis film was a narrative arc. So the, the Metropolis film is actually told as a, a narrative, you know, is actually edited as a narrative, mm -hmm. even though I eclipsed um, probably about <laughs> an hour and a half from it. When I started to work with THX, I, I realized I wasn't that interested in the narrative of THX. Narrative of Metropolis is very, very important in a way. I, I left out the parts of the narrative that I didn't want because I think the film is sentimental and I think it's naive. I mean, it's, I can't explain it. Parts of it are brilliant and prescient, but parts of it are very naive. Um, and so I, I cut out the parts that I, let's say, had some contempt for, actually. Um, with THX, I wanted, um, I wanted it to have the same effect, almost, that the algorithm has in our lives, right? You, you go onto a social platform, you look at it for a minute, you look at it for 10 seconds, not even a minute. Um, you know, you turn your phone on, you scroll for a minute, you turn, you know, so, so the, the THX has to have that kind of um, pulsing algorithmic regime mm. aspect. Um, but again, with THX, there were, THX is a very flawed, it's very prescient and very flawed. Um, I think it's flawed both formally and also narratively. Um, so it really, you know, when I worked with films previously, they were, they were um, with a very positive regard when I drew from them. But in this one, it was about cutting, cutting out most of what I didn't mm -hmm. want. And, um, and it's through the cutting out that um, 
it, 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 it's through whatever is cut out that, that the statement is also being made, which is you know, the solution that both films offer to the problems that they pose, I think are very naive. Um, right? Well, yes, I would say there's no hope in your <laughs> work. No easy hope, I would say. That's true. No happy end. And, yeah. yeah? Yeah, no, it's interesting because <clears throat> in Metropolis it ends with this uh, moral, you know, the heart should mediate between the hand and the, and the mind. Mind, yeah. Um, really, it's the heart should mediate. What they're really implying is, what he's really implying is that the heart should mediate between the heart and the psyche, mm -hmm. right? The, the greed of, of the capitalist, mm -hmm. right? It's not so much the mind. And in THX, uh, there's this final scene, which is so sentimental that I, I almost couldn't bear watching it, uh, where the one character escapes, one and actually resurfaces and sees a sun, sunrise. Yeah, or sunset, yeah. OK, so um, I would like to uh, continue with no hope, yes? <laughs> um, so in Who Will Save Us, I think, the monstrous past and the dystopian future from the past are back in the present. This is my interpretation. Uh, and the traumatic history and disastrous future cannot be distanced from uh, the present time. And more, uh, they are coming back as a literal repetition or, I just realized that, as an advent of catastrophe that is happening now. Um, because we are in the future of both films, yeah. one may say. And uh, in this context, who will save us is a deeply provocative question. And I would like to ask you, um, well, who will save us? So how do you perceive the potentiality of art and cultural work? I want to, but I, I just want to yeah. intervene in a very, yeah. in a smaller way first. I don't know if I can answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> whether art will save us, which I know it won't. But I, I want to say that there is hope in the film. And, and, and you just made me realize what it is, mm -hmm. Louisa. Which is that um, <clears throat> I think that what makes me despair the most about this particular moment is the question of disavowal mm -hmm. on the part of, um, of the masses. So of the of populist discourse, of populist, let's say, both right-wing and liberal populist discourses, I think have the same thing in common, which, the same problem in common, which is this question of disavowal, of, um, of the subject not being willing to do the work of understanding the contradictions and complexities within which they live. So, you know, the fact that the film ends, this film basically, okay, it, it ends with the bonfire of, of the witch, but, but right before that is, is the plea, you know, who will save us. So in a way, what's in, for me implicit is, see, what's implied in the group, you know, which is this plea, who will save us, is not spoken. Mm -hmm. So I think to speak it is very, very important. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, the difference between not speaking it and not acknowledging that the implicit plea of the group is who will save us. In other words, the, the right-wing populist mob, the liberal populist mob, let's say, both have the same plea and are both looking for the savior but they don't articulate it as such. There's a naturalized process by which the leader appears natural to these groups, right? Appears to arise naturally for these groups. Mm -hmm. um, I think just articulating the, uh, the plea mm -hmm. alters the group some, you know? 
because it, it's no longer a disavowal. Mm -hmm. I think the greatest danger is the disavowal. Do you know what I, do you know what I mean? Yes, um, I, I just started to think that in both works, I mean, in uh, Who Will Save Us and in Missing Usher, actually there are two modes of thinking about history. So in Who Will Save Us, uh, there is this um, gesture and I would say this is the potentiality of, of art, yes, mm. of artistic work, of cultural work. This is this gesture of illuminating repetitions and disavowals, historical disavowals, and um, calling for recognition, yes. Uh, whereas in Missing Usher, because I also would like to touch upon this wonderful work, uh, there is a completely different concept of history and I would like to use what Melanie said in one of our conversation. I think that there's a concept of history that perhaps could save us. Uh, this is a concept of history which is very much connected with care because Missing Usher is not only about, you know, art market, neoliberalism and so on, but it's also about building knowledge in an alternative way, I would say. Hmm through um, maintenance, through, um, you know, caring about legacy of certain artistic figures, cult cultural figures, but also um, ideas and, and, and thoughts. And um, I just thought that uh, this film, this film piece, uh, builds completely different and um, I would say prophetic image of what history could be, you know, connected with, <laughs> with Kerr and uh, more affirmative, I would say, notions. And uh, can I say something yeah. about that? Yeah. Because uh, you're making me think about that project in a very different way than I usually do. What, what people who haven't seen it don't know is that um, this little artwork that I made, it, it gets sold to a, a corporate collection and then at some point the, the corporation thinks, well, we don't want this art collection anymore and, and it throws some things in the garbage and it, it auctions some works off. Mine happened to be auctioned off, God knows how, for very little, much less than it sold for. And and the piece, when I when I find it, is damaged. You know, it's literally like it's been thrown in the in the garbage. But it's also because the trajectory of that piece has to do with the fact that it's not a very um, adequate market piece. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because there is the the reason it receives no care. The reason it is not seen as valuable as part of a legacy is that it, it has not entered the market properly, right? So, so in a way, what that trajectory shows <laughs> is that the piece, um, that anything that lives outside, any art that lives outside the market will not be cared for will not be protected, you know, and will not be given longevity. I mean, that's in a, in a way why I emphasize the, how damaged the work is, you know, when, when it's found. I think it, uh, this is something that happens not only to artworks, but also to works of thinking and works of, you know... Um, and human beings. And human beings, yes. Human beings exactly. who exist outside the proper markets. No, I mean, really, if you look at that, I never thought about it this way, but that little damaged piece is like the human, you know, the, the expendable human subject today. Yes, exactly. It's a you know um, non-human or beyond human uh, subjectivity, and I just uh, I just thought to myself that um, missing Usher is also a piece that um, 
uh, tells us a lot about the process of thinking, you know, thinking and acting, acting as thinking and thinking, thinking as acting. And this is very, um, you know, uh, beloved, I would say, idea of Hannah Arendt, but I'm not going to go into this, this direction. But I just wanted to ask you one more question and we will open the discussion for, mm. for the public. Mm -hmm. Because these issues of uh, history, memory, archive, thinking, rethinking, translating, retranslating, and caring uh, are present in your work you know, for a very long time. And they are changing mm. constantly in your process of uh, acting and thinking through visual works. So I wonder, uh, how do you perceive this phenomenon and relation between them, between them, namely history, memory, thinking, archive, art, artistic inquiry uh, at the moment? I don't know <clears throat> exactly at the moment, but you've made me think of a different way to think about the my piece, An Inadequate History of Conceptual Art, which is a piece that um, anonymously records people's reactions to their in-person experiences of conceptual art in the 60s and 70s. And uh, it, it is a kind of, I, I, I think of it now, I mean, from what you're, based on what you're saying, I, I, I can think about it as a kind of archive of affect, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an archive that isn't usually maintained, you know, and isn't, um, so I never thought about it that way very much, but um, that maybe you could see all these pieces in a way as, um, all these uh, art projects as a way of, of bringing in the tangential, mm -hmm. you know, um, as opposed to what is normally given primacy either in what's written about in art or what's presented by curators, um, that it's more quotidian and more, it's a different kind of archive. Um, I don't know, that's my only reaction to what you were saying. So one more question, and we will open the discussion, I promise. Are you sure? Yes, uh, <laughs> you know, continuing the um, affect uh, there is this missing, in missing Usher, so this, this longing, longing for Usher, longing for his artistic practice, for Michael Usher himself, but also for something else. I can read it, that there is this, this something else. What, what is it, <laughs> Sylvia? That you are you know, missing so much. By the way, did I ever tell you the story about Michael Asher in the letter? No. No. I never connected it to missing Asher. This is a crazy of me. Um, as, as is represented in the video, when, when I did this piece and it sold, um, I knew I was a little bit worried. The piece is based on an image from a previous project of Michael Asher's work that I reproduced. And it's a kind of image of absence, actually. But um, it, it was an image from a piece he did that was a critique of group shows. And I was making a later critique of group shows, so I replicated his work in a different way. And I knew that he did not sell work, that he was. Um, certainly did not sell to any private collections. I'm not sure whether he allowed his work to be sold to institutions, but I don't even think he did. So he had a very, he was very rigorous in that regard. He did not want to enter the market. And so I, I wrote him a letter, which is represented in the video. Uh, so I, I explained the work to him and I told him that I hope he wasn't upset that I had replicated his work and it had sold into a collection. And so that began a little friendship of ours. And I wrote, so I wrote to him, he wrote to me, this is all the letters that are in mm -hmm. the video. Mm -hmm. And then I went to teach for a couple of weeks at Cal Arts and I had dinner with him and I got to know him a little bit better. And then we continued the correspondence. And then um, 
it was a very busy time in my life. My son was quite young and I was working like m with my art and teaching or whatever. And so I got a letter from him at some point and um, I was so eager to read it, but I was so uh, overwhelmed by things that I put it aside on my desk. I didn't tell you the story? No. I put it aside on my desk, and I didn't tell you no. the story? I put, it, <laughs> I put it aside on my desk, and I thought, when I have a moment, I'm going to read this letter. And then I went back to it a week later, and I couldn't find the letter. And the letter was missing. And I, I looked everywhere, and I couldn't find it. And I didn't feel it was right to pretend to him that I knew what was in it, because I had no idea what he had written. I hadn't opened it at all. So I wrote him a letter apologizing profusely and explaining what happened, and he never wrote to me again. And subsequently, I don't know, 15 years later, uh, no, maybe 10, 12 years later, I had a show in LA, and he was quite ill then. And at my opening, someone said to me, you know, he's here, he never goes to openings, but he didn't come and talk to me. So there is that missing letter, the purloined letter, you know, and I, I, I will never know what was in that letter, and it, it ruptured the friendship, you know. But for me, the, the ending that's of the, the, the last frame of that video, which says, um, you know, it starts out with missing Asher, the first frame, and the last frame is Asher found. Um, but I do have a very uh, kind of, you know, emotional uh, connection to, to his work because it, it, it did shape my, my work. I, he also, was also a lovely, per, really wonderful person. But then there was the missing, you know, the purloined letter, which was also, will always be missing, you know. I think it's a very good moment to open the discussion <coughs> about missing letters and not only missing letters. So, please, we are waiting for your questions. <laughs> yeah, um, in regard to the discourse that you were making before, um, the, the connection between that monster and uh, who will save us, um, the fact that in my, like my opinion, I think, yeah, that as you said, both of them um, made clear this um, intention to speak to both of the groups. Uh, and you can see like in that monster, in also the shifting of the pronouns. And here, I think um, that the question of the mob um, is it's really clear in Metropolis. They are like, um, the geometry of the construction of the image is like um, used to show like a dehumanization uh, of, uh, of the people and instead on the other hand we have the machine that um, just produce work uh, it, it just it just used to um, to keep people uh, doing something to not to not think I mean so um, I, I think it's a really interesting choice, this film, for the contemporary area. <laughs> but my question would be, as you said, there is like, um, um, there are some parts that are really naive in that film. <laughs> and uh, there is this will to solve the, um, the social question with the, um, the romantic part, okay, let's say. And, but I, I, I wasn't expecting to see Maria in your film. Uh, to see you know, because of the... To see more the, of the robot? Yeah, no, the, the lady, <laughs> when she become like... Uh, she oh, 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 oh. <laughs> okay. Why did you... It's because she was also in Frankenstein. You know, you, you choose one particular Frankenstein movie, in which there was the wife also. And so... <laughs> Okay. The question would be about her. Why did, you just Why did I cut her out? So for, 
for people who haven't watched the whole of Metropolis, uh, a very significant part of the narrative is um, when the workers start to rise up, um, there's an attempt on the part of um, the boss, one might say, and, and the boss is um, uh, the, the figure who creates the robot to, there, there's a female figure who is a kind of, represents the heart, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, she leads the uprising. She, she precipitates and creates the uprising because she represents the heart and, and the workers follow her. Um, what, the, what the scientist who creates the robot in Metropolis does is he creates a new robot. He, he, he kidnaps her uh -huh. and he creates a new robot who looks exactly like her, but who acts like a kind of decadent witch. And that is the figure that the mob then rushes to kill. And in a way, you're, you're very right to ask this question because um, what that figure represents in Metropolis is how easily the mob is formed through that um, trick, you know, through that subterfuge, right? Um, why did I take it out? <laughs> I felt, you know, to be quite honest, it's a formal decision because in order, I thought about it, by the way, I thought about it a lot, but to bring that character in, I would have had to make an hour long film. Because um, it, it's also interesting, the, um, the figure of Maria, because, um, by, I mean, I've started Metropolis, that's why I know so much oh. about <laughs> <laughs> university. Uh, that the, um, there is the, um, the team of the vision in the film. That's like Freda as a vision that's like diegetic, that's useful for narration. Instead, uh, Maria is a more um, psychic, uh, I mean, um, eye. It, it's more about introspection and psyche. But I have and, a better, I have yeah. a better answer. For you. <laughs> I, ha I have a better answer for you. Try this new and improved answer. I, I know more why I left her out because what I was trying to convey in in the in the film loop <clears throat> was the fact that there should not be a specific figure who is the enemy. Yeah. Because that's the point. Mm -hmm. It has to be abstracted. Otherwise it has to uh, reproduce the same. Exactly. Situation. We're producing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So to have to have the figure be concrete and real mm -hmm. is bes is beside the point. It's yeah. you know, I'm I was trying to represent how um, a kind of uh, introjective projection, you know, the, how the process of projective identification, I should say, I'm sorry, projective identification occurs where there has, there doesn't have to be anything out there. That's the point. It's just, it's a fan, it's an illusion, it's a fantasy, it's a projection. Um, so I, I couldn't use a concrete character. And if you notice, I took out the first, I took out the, 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 the heroine as well. There was no need for the heroin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what did you say you did choose a concrete scapegoat, which was the witch, which has such a long history? Only as a word. Only, yeah, only as a concept. Yes, it, I, I chose the history. Yeah. But I couldn't. But it, has a, it does lean politically on a certain side. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, no, I, but I just couldn't personify it. Okay. And, and I do think that it was important for me that it be a feminine term. Yeah. Now, it didn't have to be a feminine term. Mm -hmm. I could have chosen something else. It is a feminine term in, in Metropolis, but I created a lot of those titles, so I could have changed it completely. I, I did want it to be a feminine term, because then it does invoke these periods of, of history where, you know, these repeated periods where the figure of the witch is replayed as, as the, the threatening, you know, external figure. It's a fabricated threat as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 
I mean, Louisa was telling me that uh, in, the, in the Polish situation with regard to um, outlawing abortion, yeah. that the women who protested in support of abortion were called witches recently. So yeah. this is a new invocation. Yeah, so it's a new context. You were called a witch. <laughs> And um, uh, well, the, the protests were called by the participants of the protests, you know, the black protests. So for me, the, you know, this, this film also is very much, con con it recontextualizes itself, you know, considering different places and, and different um, political situations very much. That's why I ask you also about the uh, rhetorical mode because um, that monster is an allegory. And uh, in the conversation you had with Melanie, and you can uh, read this wonderful uh, interview, uh, you are talking also about who, who will save us, you know, very much in the spirit of allegory. Mm. Uh, but I'm not sure about it, actually. Mm. 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 So I also wanted to <laughs> to ask you, if I may, <laughs> before you, um, you know, pose the next question well, about but, the allegory. But Louisa, the, the, yeah, we had this discussion before at uh, breakfast or something, but, <laughs> but the, the, when Metropolis came out, I think it was an allegory. Mm -hmm. When THX came out, I think it was an allegory. When we view them now, I think you're right. They're no longer allegorical. They are kind of concrete in a way. They're descriptive, yeah. right? But that's because they were prescient in their time. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think allegory requires that kind of prescience. But uh, I, think, I think that one has to look at them in these double temporal uh, um, context. I think there is this uncanny sense when you watch those films now that they're no longer allegory. I mean, that's what you were saying. Mm -hmm. yes, they're just that's... descriptive. Um, because I think that what THX really foresaw, which is kind of amazing, because as, as I've pointed out to you before, uh, I, I did a little bit of research and I found out that that uh, George Lucas was like two years ahead of the development of the chip, the, the computer chip. So although the computer had been developed for, you could say, even over a century, the, the, the idea, the certain ideas behind the computer, uh, but the actual computer chip was not developed until you know, a few years after he made this film. And I think that what he foresaw in a way was, uh, yeah, it's easy to tell. I think the worst part of it is it's easy to tell a story about total control, you know, by the machine. But what I think is more interesting in the film is how the bodies become um, filled with data. You know, they're, they're like, um, they represent what we are literally today. That's why it's not an allegory today, because we are data now. You know, we we're basically um, always connected to an interface that takes data from us, and uh, so we're always working. By the way, always working now um, in providing that. You know, and the, and THX to some extent it really kind of for, foresees this. You know, I don't mm -hmm. I don't like the more um, I guess what New Yorkers call the schmaltzier part mm -hmm. of THX, you know, which is, um, you know, this idea of total control of the body and the bodies shouldn't touch, and although that's relevant also. Um, but I think it's in the interstices of the film that it really gets very interesting. You know, the, the kind of, um, the constant eruption of the psyche uh, and, 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 and sentiment that, uh, but it's the eruption of the psyche is always trying to break through and then the drugs are suppressing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, not just drugs, but also um, the way they use uh, 
digitize sexual uh, material, the way they use digitized religious material. Um, I don't know. It has interesting components in that regard. Did we get any? No questions. No, not yet. Um, so if you're oh, interested yeah. Wait, online, if you, you can also um, post questions online. Yeah. Just told them. <laughs> no, they can. Yeah, they but can. But Rosa, you had a question. I, 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 I wanted you to maybe talk a bit more about touch, because it was a, you alluded just now that you had maybe more to say about it. And it was a moment that really stood out in that film. And, and it also exists in the Asher film, like yes. your touch. Yeah. I Very much. Maybe this yearning that you were asking about, mm -hmm. what is this yearning towards Asher? And maybe there's something about touch or, you know. Um, I, um, when I, I, I sent the link to um, the art historian, Minion Nixon, and, and she's, who I think may be listening now, and she sent a note back to me saying that that frame of the two um, faces uh, with the caption really stood out to her as being the most anachronistic in the film. And, um, and I was saying to Louis, which I was really struck by, I did not want to include that. I felt it was, uh, I was slightly embarrassed by it. But, but I also felt that from a, a kind of, um, I don't know, a kind of narrative point of view, I, I had to allude to the body in some way. Um, because the rest of the time, it's, it's the, the digital or the machine. Um, although the body is also extremely relevant to the mob. <laughs> but, you know, but by the way, I think the reason I don't represent the mob in the digital is that I, I think it's become disembodied, in, you know, obviously. But I did decide to include that little um, clip. Um, yeah, I, th I, I think it's important. I was talking to Louise about Mignon's comment, and I said, I don't know if I've interpreted correctly what Mignon pointed out in, in, in calling it so anachronistic, and I think she's right. She said it, you know, it seems the most kind of uh, archaic, you know, of all the images beyond Metropolis, more archaic to us now. And I, we kind of disagreed about this, but it made me start thinking about how there isn't much preoccupation these days, at least in the West, with sex in the way that I remember it in the 80s or the 90s. I don't even hear it. It's, it's not very present in social media. It's not very present in, in pop TV series. There just isn't much kind of sexual. I, I just don't see it that much anymore. So I, I, don't, I don't know exactly why that is, whether, whether the body has now op occupies a different realm, or whether sexuality, I, and I don't, what I mean by sexuality is not orientation or identity, but literal bodies in sex. It's just not pre that present in the, am I wrong? I don't see it that present in the culture anymore. I mean, it's present, but not maybe like in this frame. Yeah, but. Do you, uh, but, I, but it was very present <clears throat> in the 80s and the 90s. Not as a feeling represented. Even as a part of pop TV narratives as, or films. I mean, if you think about all the films that have come out in the United States, all the crappy films, right? Mm. The popular, super popular films that get a lot of circulation, I don't see anything in them about uh, have something to do with, with the way of like, yeah, the, the women's body was used in those kind of imageries and now it's more conscious maybe. So we have to eliminate, we just have to well, eliminate I don't know, the body. Like, you know, there used to be advertisements of women with underwear in the Altalans and it's not like that so much anymore. 
It's I true. Think, for instance, that, you know, and if that is, yeah, that is sexualizing some, you know, like there's a lot of cuts on that. I, I agree with you, Laura, but I have to say, because yeah. I'm a little bit older than you, that I think a little bit, a lot, I, I've seen the change only in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, in other words, I saw endless sexualization of women's bodies in advertising up until about five I years think ago. It has to do with Me Too movement and um, I don't like, think. You know, I think it does have I don't think so. I think it has to do, in my opinion, I may be wrong, but I think it has to do with the confluence of anxiety about, like that the concerns of a new generation have to do with work and, um, and the digital realm, which is very disembodied. And somehow this doesn't, the preoccupation is no longer for young generations. The, pre the, the a primary preoccupation is no longer Sex. I, I also agree. I think it's a combination. It might be. So that's maybe the symptom of a sort of larger development away from the physical, like with a continuing immaterialization that is just another sphere where we could uh, sort of take note of that. I, I don't know, but I just don't see it. I, you know, I mean, I can only end by saying I. I it doesn't seem as evident to me as it used to. One of the main forms in the abstract video is a new touch yeah. of paper. And that's like, there is this sensuality. And it's like, um, you know, sometimes you, you, move, you move in ways that you didn't intend to, like you stumble with your hands, and that brings like a real human quality to the material. Mm -hmm. So there's that element of touch also. Well, you know, the piece has in it this folding. And it has in it this, um, both the appearance and disappearance. So when I was trying to think of a, a kind of visual rhetoric for, for the script, um, I, and, and, and then Louisa says, you know, it's about, it's about a kind of geology also, you know, the layer, the geology of, of um, what's known, what isn't known, mm -hmm. what, what's been hidden, what, anyway. Yeah. Some more questions? Otherwise we are kind of close to finishing uh, this conversation. I mean, we can still Continue. have some more conversation, but we might uh, shut down the live stream. Um, so, more questions? I think we've hard people out? <laughs> no, I think it was very interesting. <laughs> well, can I just finish our conversation with a little quotation? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, excuse my English, uh, but um, um, since I, I perceive Sylvia's work very much as, as love. Uh, as a what? As love <laughs> oh. for thinking. <laughs> And this love for thinking, I understand as an ethical condition for acting. I wanted to, uh, you know, give you a little gift, mm. which is a, a quotation from a Life of Mind by Hannah Arendt. And it's a very long quotation, so excuse me, but <laughs> it's also very beautiful. Um, so it goes like that. Uh, my the problem of good and evil our faculty of telling right from wrong be connected with our faculty of thought? Could the activity of thinking as such, the habit of examining whatever happens to come to pass or to attract attention, regardless of results and specific content, could this activity be among the conditions that make men abstain from evil doing or even actually condition them against it. End of quote. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, both shows of Laura Langer, Headlines, and Silvia Kolbowski, Who Will Save Us, are still on view until the 27th of November. Hope to see you here in Klaus.
バイバイ。